All right, well, welcome everyone to today's episode of the Jason Modar Show. So for today's episode, I wanted to discuss the idea of diversity, specifically diversification within Christian churches, this desire to make Christian churches less white, to have more non-white membership within churches. So what this has reminded me of, or, or what I realized is that this is the new seeker-sensitive movement. The new seeker-sensitive movement is seeking to diversify churches to specifically make them more non-white, to make them less white. So the seeker-sensitive movement of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s, and to some extent it's still around today, but it was a movement that focused on evangelism to non-Christians. So everything about someone's experience at church, the message, the worship music, everything about it became oriented not to the believer, not to church being a place where the saints meet together to hear the word rightly divided, to sing praise and worship to the Lord, to recite scripture together, to eat of the bread and drink of the wine, to confess sins. It was no longer for that. It became about making church experience as palatable as possible to the non-believer. So church was no longer about the Christian. It was about the non-believer getting them through the door so that they could hear the gospel presented to them. Well, what often happened was they heard a watered-down gospel message, watered-down worship music, often effeminate worship music, and church became a more watered-down experience because it was no longer about the things that I mentioned previously, orienting the church towards Christians and the discipleship of the saints, but it became about appealing to non-Christians. So, of course, naturally, the seeker-sensitive movement led to a massive watering down of robust biblical Christianity. So the primary focus became welcoming non-Christians. And so again, if that meant watering things down, watering down the sacredness of the church experience to make it more casual, more casual worship, more casual presentation of the division of the word, a more casual dress, as long as it was appealing to the masses, to the non-Christian masses, then that was an achievement of the goal. And now we're seeing the same kind of thing with the diversity movement, the new seeker-sensitive movement, diversification of the church. So the old movement was about attracting the non-believers and orienting the church in such a way that your church would attract non-believers. But now it's about orienting your church in such a way in that you attract non-whites to the church. So attracting non-whites now becomes the goal. And I think the results of this will be the same as the results of the seeker-sensitive movement, which led to watered-down gospel presentations, worship services, application of God's law, really in all realms, family, civil, and church. The same thing's going to happen with inserting DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion into the church. Because when you let the woke camel's nose under your tent, it's really just a matter of time before the entire camel makes its way into the tent. We've seen this in higher education, in government school education, in corporate boardrooms, corporate culture, corporate diversity training, employee training. Once this makes its way into the institution, it's just not long before it takes over that institution. And we've seen this within Christianity and Christian organizations that have gone woke like Crew, formerly Campus Crusade for Christ. That's an example of what happens when you allow this in. And the same kind of thing is going to happen within our churches if we give in to the whole notion of, oh, my church is too wide, it's not diverse enough. So a couple of problems with this. Uh, so number one, the number one problem with this that I want to touch upon is this idea that diversity, specifically ethnic diversity within local churches, that's not something that's held up as a virtue in the scriptures. It's not something that the scriptures teaches us to do whatsoever, that our churches should be ethnically diverse. Now, we shouldn't be attempting to prevent our churches from being 
ethnically diverse, but we also shouldn't be attempting to force our churches to be less white. Now, some people want to trot out the passage in Revelation about a numberless group of every tribe, tongue, and nation being before the Lord of glory, worshiping him. And they point to that and they say, see, this is why we should have diversification, ethnic diversification, so-called racial diversification, non-white diversification within our churches. That's a misunderstanding and a misapplication of that passage. That is a snapshot of eternity. That is a snapshot of the second coming of Christ once all Christians have been gathered and we have the resurrection of the dead. We get our new bodies, the new heavens and the new earth come down. It's a snapshot of eternity and it's a it's an anachronism. It's superimposing Marxist ideology, the ideology of Marx and his descendants. It's superimposing that ideology, this oppressor oppressed ideology, this idea of class warfare, this idea of moving from Marxism to cultural Marxism to postmodernity to this critical theory mindset of white oppressor, white suppressor, that making its way into the religious world, including the religion of Christianity and this idea that in order to make up for the mistakes and sins and issues of the past and in order to make sure that the faith is palatable, we ethnically cleanse our churches essentially of whites and have more ethnic diversity. That is superimposing all of that 19th, 20th, and 21st century ideology on a 1st century text that was written somewhere before 70 AD, probably 65, between 65 and 69 AD, superimposing all of that on that text. What that passage teaches us in Revelation is that God wins, is that the Great Commission, that we are to go into all the nations, all of the ethnoi, and preach the gospel to them, baptize them, and teach them all the things that Jesus taught and commanded us to do. It's a demonstration that that message, that that charge, and that Jesus also talks about that we have recorded from Luke at the beginning of the book of Acts, that eventually this message is going to go out to the entire world. That snapshot in Revelation is God wins. That plan and purpose that God instituted, that Jesus died and resurrected for, that that comes to fruition. That's what that passage is about. It's not about ethnic diversity in local churches. And then even within the classical tradition, you don't see diversity being held up as a virtue. It's just non-existent essentially until you really get to modernity and until you get to Marx and then everything that happens post-Marx. That's essentially when you when you see it come to fruition. But before then, you don't really see it at all. And then another thing, uh, this idea of um, when you say things like, no, uh, diversity is not our strength. Diversity is not a virtue held up in the classical tradition, nor is it a virtue that is held up biblically. Uh, people hear that. And they'll hear you say things like, oh, you know, it, it, it actually it does not warm my heart to see less whites in the church. It does not warm my heart to see churches become or Christian institutions become more diversified to effectively become less white. People, people will hear you say things like that. Oh, well, you must be bigoted. You must be a racist. Well, no, that's actually not an implication at all. It just means that I'm not excited about the embracing of cultural Marxism in churches. We shouldn't actively seek to prohibit anyone from coming to your church based on their ethnicity, but nor should you be non-white seeker sensitive in churches. It's not a biblical virtue, but not only that, it's, it's not practical. Because when does your church become non-white enough? When are you diverse enough? How much of a percentage of blacks or Koreans or Japanese or Mexicans, whomever, when are you diverse enough? By what standard are you diverse enough? Is there a biblical standard for how diverse your church should be? And then not only that, but once you meet this quota, however you determine it, whatever it is, how hard are you going to work to keep it? At what cost are you going to diversify? And at what cost are you going to keep some sort of a diversity quota 
you know, when effectively is it enough? And the honest answer to it is that it's never enough. It's never going to be good enough. There's no um, standard for when it's good enough. You would just move with the cultural winds. As the cultural winds blow, you would be blown along with them. Your institution would be blown along with them. And so no Christian institution should seek to diversify. They should seek every Sunday at a church, for instance, to faithfully preach the word, to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs to the Lord, to baptize their children, to give membership vows, to have people take membership vows, to come to the table and eat of the bread and drink of the wine, to confess sins. That should be the focus. That should be the focus of churches. And if that means that your church remains as white as a bag of bleached flour, then so be it. That's just the way that it goes because fidelity to God and his word is far more important, not fidelity to DEI, not fidelity to newfangled ideas of virtue based on cultural winds changing. We need to have some sort of standard, and it has to be the scriptures, and we stick to that standard, and let the ethnic pieces and ethnic chips fall where they may within our churches and within our institutions, or we'll end up losing those institutions. All right, well, that's all that I got for today. Just had those thoughts uh, on my mind, just it popped into my head. I, I'm not sure if anybody's ever put these pieces together that DEI initiatives, that diversification, ethnic diversification of churches and Christian institutions is the new seeker-sensitive movement. I'm sure somebody has put the pieces of that puzzle together before. I don't remember anybody else saying it, and I'm not saying that to say that I'm some sort of an innovator, but just the thought popped into my head the other night while I was sitting on my porch uh, listening to uh, a podcast and I wanted to share those thoughts with you to help us understand the dangers of buying into this seemingly innocent endeavor, the diversification of churches. It's anything but innocent. It's insidious, and it will wreck and ruin our institutions as it has wrecked and ruined every single institution that in which this cultural Marxism, this postmodern notion of DEI, when it worms its way somewhere, it ends up burrowing deep and, and destroying it and eating it from the inside out. Well, thank you all so very much for swinging by and listening to today's episode. Appreciate all the support that you give the show. Hope you keep it up, and we'll catch you next time. God bless.